As Pompeius and Metellus dodged constant guerrilla attacks in Spain, and Lucullus set out for Anatolia, things in Rome carried on as usual. Having recently become a father with the birth of a daughter named Julia, Julius Caesar began planning for the long-term security of his family. Though he worked for a number of years as a court advocate, Caesar, who was only 25 the year after Pompeius left for Spain, was still some years from being able to take his first step onto the cursus honorum. Though having won the civic crown guaranteed him a seat in the Senate, his voice was not heard. The Senate had a speaking order when debating legislation. Beginning with the current consuls, then ex-consuls, current praetors followed by ex-praetors, current and ex-aediles and questors, the order of speakers meant that debates were decided long before discussion came to those senators without office. These senators, referred to as backbench senators, were simply used for votes. In order to affect policy in any way, Caesar needed to start the cursus honorum. Oration and rhetoric were among the most highly prized skill sets necessary to win public favor when seeking governmental offices. And though Caesar had earned himself a reputation for being very talented, he knew he could not compete against the likes of Quintus Hortensius, Rome's top orator, or even newcomers like Cicero, who had shot to fame by successfully exposing the corruption within Sulla's regime. As security for future career and political advancement, Caesar made the choice, once again, to leave Rome. So that he could improve his public speaking skills, he travelled to the island of Rhodes in order to continue studying under Apollonius Molin, the very tutor under whom he and Cicero had trained in their youth. After several months of study, and the decision to return home, Caesar unexpectedly became a victim of the Aegean Sea's piracy problem. The ship he had chosen to sail him back to Rome was captured. Recognizing that in Caesar, the pirates had acquired a patrician of some value, they took him hostage. After transporting Caesar to one of their hideout islands in the Aegean Sea, the pirates wrote ransom letters to be sent to Caesar's family back in Rome. Because Caesar was obviously a well-born nobleman, the pirates demanded the standard sum of 20 talents of silver, or approximately $330,000, for Caesar's safe return. When Caesar discovered their asking price, he insisted they write again to Rome and change their ransom demand. Twenty talents of silver was the standard ransom for a noble. But, Caesar was not just a noble. He was a senator, and the recipient of a military crown. Instead of twenty talents of silver, Caesar demanded they ransom him for fifty talents, or approximately $825,000. This anecdote is often used to demonstrate some level of arrogance and vanity on Caesar's part, but it seems much more likely that in raising his own value, he better guaranteed his position while in the company of his captors. And with an additional 30 talents to be made, the pirates were more than happy to accommodate Caesar's insane demand. As Caesar's mother, wife, and other family members scrambled to borrow the exorbitant funds to pay off his ransom, Caesar settled in for his captivity. Confident they would not risk so much money by harming him, Caesar ordered the pirates around as if he was their commander. Amidst promises to return and crucify them, Caesar criticized everything they did as substandard. He shushed them when he wanted to sleep, and even forced them to listen to the poetry he wrote while in captivity. If they did not appreciate his poetry, he dismissed them as illiterate. After 38 days, Caesar's ransom was paid. The pirates put Caesar on a ship and sailed him to Miletus, or modern-day Balar, Turkey. True to his word, he raised a legion and small fleet of ships. After some time spent searching, Caesar eventually found his way back to the pirates' stronghold. Upon transporting them all to the governor of Asia, Marcus Junius Solanus, they were thrown into prison. But, because Solanus vacillated over the appropriate punishment for kidnapping, Caesar, himself, stormed into the prison and ordered them crucified in his own name. However, because the pirates had treated him well during his captivity, Caesar showed them what he called mercy, by cutting their throats before crucifixion, so they would not suffer agonizingly slow deaths hanging on their crosses. After plundering the pirates' island, it's likely Caesar reclaimed some portion of the fifty talents of silver that had been raised on his behalf. To improve his own financial position as well, Caesar sold all the women and children of the pirates into slavery. With his vengeance against the pirates sated, and his plundering of their island complete, 
Caesar then turned his fleet and auxiliary legions towards the east. There, he offered them, and his own services, to the consuls, Lucullus and Cotta, who were engaged in the war against Mithridates. Lucullus, who was happy to receive fresh troops and ships, made Caesar one of his military tribunes, and Caesar served under Lucullus for an unspecified amount of time. By 73 BC, Caesar won election to a minor office. It is unclear whether he had returned to Rome by then, or had been voted to this minor posting in absentia. A priest from within the College of Pontifices died, leaving a vacancy. Though this was mostly an administrative post, and did not count as part of the cursus honorum, it was from within the college that each Pontifex Maximus was co-opted. The current Pontifex Maximus was the same Metellus Pius who was currently in Spain trying to coordinate the takedown of Sertorius with Pompeius Magnus. Pius, rather than being co-opted to the office, had been appointed to it by the dictator, Sulla, in response to the Marian's murder of the previous Pontifex Maximus. But Metellus Pius was no longer a young man. Considering the number of close calls he had suffered at the hands of Sertorius, it seemed unlikely he would hold the office for much longer. In joining this particular office, it's evident Caesar had his eye on the office of Pontifex Maximus. The Pontifex Maximus was the highest elected religious official within the Roman Republic. His official duties included the regulation of public morality for the city of Rome. He was the moral watchdog over both, the Roman people and her politicians. He unilaterally held the power to issue fines whenever he decided someone had violated either religious custom or cultural taboos. The Pontifex Maximus was also authorized to go before the Senate and speak on legislation. The College of Pontifices was a group of priests that met with the Pontifex Maximus behind closed doors in order to vote on, and promulgate laws which governed religious life or public morality. Once these laws were agreed upon, and publicly announced by the Pontifex Maximus, they held the same force of any other law that was written in stone. And in this particular area of lawmaking, the Senate had absolutely no say in the matter. It is not difficult to imagine Caesar's interest in the office of Pontifex Maximus also being somewhat practical. Though he had, thus far, adhered to the appropriate steps of the cursus honorum, his humble dwelling in Rome's lowly Sabura was not the type of home from which holders of high office came. Eventually, in accordance with Sulla's constitutional changes to the cursus honorum, Caesar would have to be elected praetor before ever being eligible to run for the consulship. But praetors and consuls did not come from the Sabura. In order to run for the praetorship, which took quite a lot of money, Caesar needed a much more prestigious address. And, it just so happened that the man elected to the position of Pontifex Maximus was granted, as his personal home, the Regia, wherein the College of Pontifices met. Rome had few addresses more prestigious than the Regia. It was in the heart of the Forum Romanum, separating Vesta's temple from Rome's main road, the Via Sacra. In this way, the Vestal Virgins had immediate access to the Pontifex Maximus, who was their legal guardian, and the Regia helped to protect the home of the Vestals from the traffic of the busy streets. The Regia housed Rome's official calendar, and the city's most sacred historical artifacts, including the Spears of Mars. These spears were said to vibrate whenever Rome was about to befall a disaster. Though election into the College of Pontifices did not guarantee Caesar's eventual election to the office of Pontifex Maximus, it was a decisive step towards that goal. Only 15 pontiffs served within the college at any given time, replaced only upon death or the promotion of a new Pontifex Maximus. This gave Caesar a 1 in 15 chance to be elected whenever death, through military combat, or old age, tore the office from the hands of Metellus Pius. Until then, Caesar, who had already served in one priesthood, could only wait, and learn the duties of this new religious office.